Welcome back to Never Did It. I'm Jake Ziegler. I'm here with Brad Garoon. We have assigned each other a movie that we have not seen, and now we're going to talk about it. Uh, for the year 2000, I assigned Brad the movie Wonder Boys. This is absolutely one of my favorite movies. Uh, I've also read the book, and I love. I have the soundtrack that I listened to and wore out many, many times, and it's uh, just something that I wanted Brad to experience so that we could talk about it. Brad, what did you think of Wonder Boys? Before I say anything, I have a note. I have a hunch you like this movie largely because the soundtrack plays like it was made from your CD collection. <laughs> <laughs> that, that certainly doesn't hurt a, a, at all. Yes, it is. Uh, it is very much up my alley. <laughs> I really enjoy this movie. It's it's a blast. I am obsessed with the Douglas family. If you put Kirk Douglas or Michael Douglas in a movie, I will watch it. I am just I just think they are the most interesting father son acting duo maybe of all time. Probably, I think it's. Yeah. It's so wild that Michael Douglas almost didn't become an actor because his dad was such a good actor and he was just going to produce movies. And I'm really glad that didn't happen. I love his voice. I don't love that he narrates this movie. Yeah. <laughs> it's very clear what's going on here. The, he's an author and the movie is his book. I don't care. Nothing that he narrates is relevant to what's going on. Like he's narrating things that we can clearly see are happening. We don't get any any real insight into what he's thinking or feeling. He's just like, we have to do this now. Okay, I don't need that. That started to get a little annoying. Even when at the end of the movie, you see he's writing the narration to the book. In fact, that may have made it more annoying. And it's a little weirdly inconsistent, too. Like, he's not doing it through the whole movie. I thought it was, like, a little inconsistent at the times it happened. This is a problem with every movie that has narration. There's always a big chunk of the movie where it stops. And it's usually where the action is very heavy. And that really bothers me. In fact, the times that I do like voiceover narration in a movie are when it's highly stylized and throughout the entire movie. Usually in noirs or, like, Guy Ritchie-style action movies. Those like Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking. Or I don't know if it's Lock, Stock, or Snatch, but either either of those movies. For one thing, I can't understand a lot of what the characters are saying in those movies, so it's good to have someone explaining it in a language that's a little bit more accessible. <laughs> this is not that. This is a bunch of people at Harvard who is it Harvard? Not Harvard. No, it's it's somewhere in Pittsburgh. I'm not sure if they even say the name of the school, but it's definitely Pittsburgh. So this is a bunch of people in college who, you know, are very easy to understand. The narration is the only thing I didn't like about the movie. The rest of it, I thought, was a fun ride. Michael Douglas is the most likable he's ever been. And he's not he's not super likable, but he's he's very much relatable in this movie. Robert Downey Jr. is great in a supporting role. Katie Holmes is okay in her supporting role. Topher Grace, real, just like a tremendous, tremendous. Toby, uh, Toby Maguire. I always do that. <laughs> I'm not even going to cut it out. I always do that. I, I, I don't get the two of them confused, just their names. Tobey Maguire, maybe may his best role ever. Uh, really, really good stuff here. I think so, yeah. Francis McDormand, wonderful. We As mentioned always. because uh, uh, two weeks ago, we mentioned because he was in the All Quiet on the Western Front remake, made for TV remake, uh, Richard Thomas uh, as Francis McDormand's husband. Hey, That's right. I like Richard Thomas and he's really fun in this. Rip Torn has a fun little cameo in this. His, he's so good in this. Yeah, such yeah. a great little little part for him. Um, Rob McElhenney shows up for as an extra. I'm pretty yeah. sure I wrote that in my notes and then you texted me about it. I'm like, ah, it's, ah, yeah. it's more obvious than I thought it was. <laughs> he's not good in it, I can't say, because he's barely in it. Do anything, yeah. yeah. I'm. I read. I'm pretty sure he he had a at least a line in a deleted scene because he is credited. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else I'm leaving out? Oh, Cross Alan Tudyk uh, has a small part in it too, and he's wonderful. Yeah, that blew my mind. Alan Tudyk as a stoner janitor. Lots of Alan Tudyk is one of my most watched actors for 2023. I've seen more. <laughs> Alan. He, he does a ton of voice work, and I watched a ton of cartoons this year. I mean, um, we should, we haven't even really mentioned what the mo like kind of what the the story of the movie is because it's haven't a, touched on it at all. It's almost it's like a buddy buddy movie, but it's also like a road trip kind of movie but it's, it's really fun like Michael Douglas is a he's a writer like you said he's a writer he wrote a really popular well-regarded novel uh, years ago and he's been struggling to write his follow-up Robert Downey Jr. is his editor who's in town you know trying to get you know information on the follow-up like when it's coming so his career is really struggling you know he really needs this follow-up to be a hit meanwhile Tobey Maguire plays this student one of Michael Douglas's students a little bit or a lot of bit strange and they kind of get mixed up in some some shenanigans some hijinks together and uh they hang out for the next couple of days and you know like I said they go on the road it's a little it's a little bit less detail-y actually without having a specific definition destination in mind at the end but yeah they're just kind of going places together and learning about each other and having these little uh almost these little like side quests as they get to michael douglas's ultimate destination there but yeah it's just, it's really fun and all the characters are so interesting and yeah even in small little scenes you like alan tudyk he's only in those couple little scenes but he's just you know that <laughs> i love this do you get high just 
only when I'm working. Like, yeah. ah, that's so perfect. <laughs> delivers it so well it's so good there's it, there's a couple interesting things you left out which i think are important in that there really isn't a destination michael douglas's wife has just left him he's in love with francis mcdormand we learn early on she's gonna have his baby and a lot of the movie is her deciding whether or not to keep the baby or be with him or stay with her husband and then michael douglas thinks that toby mcguire is suicidal so the reason they're spending all this time together is he wants to keep an eye on him and he also thinks he might be brilliant he's written a book he's written a book too because he's written and he a book. can write in like i guess really short like he's written a book in like a couple of weeks or something written wrote an entire book right and all his classmates hate him and they're really awful like really weird anti-catholic bigotry on display in the classroom for no yeah. reason i was like whoa this is the yeah. meanest school ever <laughs> yeah michael douglas while in his like protecting toby mcguire is doing some really interesting non-speaking acting. Like Robert Downey Jr. plays his agent as like a, you know, he's kooky, he's out there, he's uh, desperate. Editor. editor, sorry. He's yeah. desperate for a win. Uh, everyone in his agency or in his uh, publishing house thinks he's a loser. And in his like manic performance, because I think this is pre-rehab for him. Yes. He talks a lot about like death and suicide and Douglas is just like very quietly like shut up shut up shut up shut up yeah. really good. <laughs> or just like nerve is like stop talking about this yeah um you've got Katie Holmes who has a crush on him that it serves as a choice can my, does Michael Douglas decide to now that his young wife has left him to get with someone even younger or to be a grown-up and dedicate himself to Francis McDormand she doesn't believe he will mm -hmm. that's really cool there's a lot going on in this movie there's that one really, really, really good scene. I love the way that Michael Douglas and Francis McDormand play this. And and Michael Douglas, I think we talked about this on the Wall Street podcast too. I think he's really underrated. And I'm I'm really I'm glad we did Wall Street and Wonder Boys in this because I think that really captures like both sides of Michael Douglas. Where in, where in Wall Street he's like the the slimy, the kind of evil, you know, just cruel, uh, win at all costs for Michael Douglas. And this is the kinder, gentler, easygoing Michael Douglas. And and they're and they're both great. But obviously, I love you love the Wonder Boys Michael Douglas more. But they have the one scene where he goes to find her in the greenhouse and he tells her in like the least convincing way possible almost shrugs his shoulders he's like i want to be with you and right. she's just like yeah not convincing at all well <laughs> what's really funny about that too is there's this other thing going on where he he's responsible for the death of her dog <laughs> And a Which lot I hate of them to movie, laugh at, but it's kind of funny. <laughs> it is. It, look, I hate to see it. I just watched the Royal Tenenbaums and I forgot that the dog dies at the end. Ooh, and I was really yes. upset when it happened. I was upset when this dog died too, although the dog is attacking him when Toby Maguire kills the dog. <laughs> Spoilers for the middle. I, this all happens very early on in the movie. Yeah. Because a lot of the movie is covering up the dog's death. It's funny because a lot, a lot of his attempts to tell her that he loves her and cares about her and wants to be with her and wants to be the father of this baby or is ready to be the father of this baby are obscured by he got too high by accident <laughs> or he's really trying to admit that he killed this dog or that Toby Maguire has robbed their house, you know, things like that. Because it turns out Toby Maguire is kind of a sociopath. Yeah, uh, dude's got issues. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. He handles it so well. And it's funny that in his 50s, he decided, all right, I'm done being a scumbag. I know that's what people wanted for me, but now I'm done with that. And now I'm going to be your fun uncle. And that has continued on to Ant-Man and the Kaminsky method where those movies, I mean, like Ant-Man 3 is terrible, but he's fun in it. Ant-Man 1 and 2 are perfectly fine and he's great in those. And the Kaminsky method, if you haven't seen it, it's it's a blast and it's you can just spend a lot of time with him mm -hmm. and Alan Arkin, which is great. R.I.P. R.I.P. Two things I think that are important to mention. Jane Adams has a fun and uh, Love small her part. Really part of it. Yeah, really small part, but so good. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Richard Knox plays her boyfriend. He's wild. <laughs> Vernon Hardapple. <laughs> Why are you calling me Vernon? <laughs> um, and getting into the other thing that I think is important to talk about, Michael Cavadias plays Antonia Sloviak, uh, a crossdresser that they keep calling a transvestite because this is movie is from 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. And Toby Maguire's character, we find out pretty early, is probably gay. And then that's woven into the story. The only thing that's a little weird about this movie is the age gaps between the people who are having sex with each other. Yeah. Um but even that, like it's all sweet. Like none of it's none of it feels like anyone's taking advantage of anyone. It's mm -hmm. it's no one's a child either. I mean everyone's an adult. Right. There's just some big age gaps. Well, I, think, um, I think Toby McGuire asks Michael Douglas at one point about the Downey Jr. Uh, crab to crabs. He can, uh, Terry Crabtree asks him like, yeah. so is he, you know, I don't think he even says gay, but he's like, is he? I think no, he, he says gay. Like, oh, does he, is he gay? And yeah. I think, my, what does he say? He goes, uh, most of the time he is. Sometimes he's not. You, you know, it's just like very casual. And he's like, oh, okay. Before that, he asks, is Antonia? And Michael Douglas goes, yes. And he goes, so yeah. does that make Terry gay sometimes there it is yeah yeah that's what it was yeah <laughs> it's a great scene and i think the antonia character 
slash Tony character later. It's a big part of the first half of the movie. And he's lovely. And the way that he cares about Crabtree and about Grady, it's it's really nice. And James, Tobey Maguire's character named James. James Lear. I remember that name. Yeah. James Lear. It's a great character. And Tobey Maguire really, he's really great in this. He's got a, a scene early on to when he first meets uh, Terry Crabtree, I think, where um, Katie Holmes wants him like, oh, do you know, do the the Hollywood deaths or, the, you know, do the list of Hollywood suicides or whatever. And he goes through the whole list and he, you know, like, and he does it alphabetically mm-hmm. because, oh, that's just how my brain works. That's the scene where Douglas is like, we need to stop talking about this. This is not good. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But then they they go to his ex wife's house. Uh, Grady wants to go there so he can apologize to his ex wife and you know kind of move on from that. And, and nobody's there, so they just like, all right, well, go in. You know, make yourself at home. And first he makes James sh- shimmy through the doggy door, which is just a funny visual. First, then they go in the house and he just, all right, all right I'm gonna make a phone call, make yourself at home. And Toby McGuire, James, he just goes over and sits on the couch. He lights up a joint and pours himself a drink. And then like his in laws come home and they're just sitting there. They just walk in and there there's this stranger sitting on their couch with a drink. He is watching I don't know, some old movie on the TV or something and there's old Tobey Maguire just sitting there all comfy. That led to a really nice scene between Michael Douglas and Philip Bosco too. Love Philip Bosco. What a great little performance in that one scene. Yeah, this is a great movie. I gave it four stars uh, because I was annoyed by the narration. I might go as high as four and a half. It's really sweet. I still have it at five because like I said, I love it. I, I read the book. Uh, Michael Ch- Chabon Chabon. I can't remember how to. I don't know. Yeah, but I yeah, I've always always loved it. And like Brad said, the soundtrack is literally out of uh, my CD collection. Uh, the Bob Dylan song at the beginning, he won an Oscar for that. And it's funny, actually, I saw Dylan in concert not long after he won the Oscar for it. And he would, I don't know if he still does. I'm sure he doesn't still do it, but he used to travel. He used to carry it. He used to bring it with him. He'd put it like on top of one of the amps or something. So you could see his little Oscar there That's on cool. tour. I always thought that was neat. So this was directed by Curtis Hansen, who went on to direct uh, LA Confidential, or, or sorry, who had previously directed before. LA Confidential. Yeah. He went on to direct 8 Mile and then not much before his death a few years ago. RIP. Yeah, that was a, that was a sad one. Yeah, since we're not going to be talking about Oscars with our next film, yeah. uh, did this win any awards? Yes. Yeah, so for Oscars, it did win the best original song. Uh, Bob Dylan wrote and performed the song uh, via satellite at the show. But it's I remember watching the performance, and you can see like Michael Douglas is just having the best time. I mean, obviously he's a you know he's a Dylan fan. He and Catherine you know, were sitting next to each other, and he's just like beaming through the whole thing and like you know bopping along to it. He's he's loving it. So great song that won the the Oscar. It was up for best film editing, which it lost to Traffic. Just probably right. Traffic is you know edited really well that's kind of one of the big points of that movie so also starring best. michael douglas also starring michael douglas yes <laughs> and uh then same for it was also up for adapted screenplay which it also lost to traffic which eh, again that's fair traffic is is a great movie yeah so this movie was also pretty big bomb it had a 50 million dollar budget and it made about 33 million dollars back on it our next movie was a huge hit Mm-hmm. And in a connection to Michael Douglas, it was directed by Peyton Reed, the director of the Ant-Man films. I gave you Bring It On. Tell now, me why. Reed, okay, so I had fond memories of this movie, but not like, it was never one of my favorites. But I remember, like, it was one of those that was on in my house. I have two sisters. It was out of my house a lot growing up. And I was like, this movie's fine. And also, you've seen most of the movies in 2000 that I've seen. So there wasn't a lot of options and i was like this will be fun you watched it back before i did i hadn't seen it since i was a kid you watched it back and you were like this movie is bad (laughs) um and you're like but i'm gonna keep watching and you're like nope it was bad and i was like kind of skeptical although you usually like things more than i do in general that's true i was still like i don't know because you know sometimes i like stuff more than you do i watched it back and this movie is bad so i'll give it to you (laughs) but it's bad in some really interesting bizarre ways so before i get into it that's why I gave it to you. There wasn't much else, and I had some fun mm. memories of it. Tell me what you thought of it, this cheerleading movie. Bring it on. Yeah. Well, for, I mean, first of all, to its credit, I think it has a really interesting idea and a really interesting concept for a movie where you've got this uh, you know, kind of affluent white school. You've got the cheerleading squad. It was a big deal. Uh, the, you know, the football team, I think, is pretty terrible, but the cheerleading squad is really good. You know, they win national championships. They're, they're very good at what they do, and they're uh, getting a new cheer captain. The old one is graduating, and she's appointing her successor. You know, okay, that's cool. Then the successor finds out that her predecessor had stolen all of their cheer routines. By the way, the the cheer captain for anyone who doesn't know is Kirsten Dunst. Uh, She's the lead of the movie. She finds out that all their cheer routines have been stolen from a school in East Compton and that that everything has just been ripped off from them. And like all the, you know, none of the routines are original. And then she's, you know, she's of course horrified by this. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we can't, you know, what do we do? Do we keep doing these routines? Do we, do we, you know, can we not do these routines? You've got this kind of moral dilemma set up. I'm like, oh, okay. Like this is a really interesting 
concept for a movie. And then even like you just look at and I remember, you know, I've seen like the DVD. I used to work at video stores. Like I remember seeing, you know, the box and the poster and all that. And you see you know, on the left side is Kirsten Dunst and like her cheerleaders. And on the other side is Gabrielle Union, who's the cheer captain of the East Compton squad. And you see them like either side. And we're like, oh, this is going to be about both of these teams. It's not. It's not at all. It's mostly about the way you know, like Kirsten Dunst and, and the White Squad. And you don't really learn that much about the other team at all. And I think that's kind of a failure of the movie. It's not even about the White Squad. It's just about Kirsten Dunst and how yeah. sad she is that people keep screwing her over. And now everyone hates her. <laughs> and that's not um, that interesting. No, and, but I think it has a worse sin than that. And that is that the script is awful and the performances are just mind bogglingly bad i i don't really under it so peyton reed yeah, before he direct- Shku, like what what's going on there well it's not even just her so before peyton reed directed this movie he directed the computer wears tennis shoes and a version of herbie the love bug this is pre Lindsay lohan starring uh bruce campbell he had only done kid stuff before this and the way the performances he gets from his actors in this movie are very much disney channel movie performances oh i, I texted you this i want you to guess which scene in this movie, I think, uh, belonged in the movie The Room, the Tommy Wiseau movie The Room. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm trying to remember the movie. I'm already, I've already watched it a couple of weeks ago now at this You're point. I don't think I'm going to guess it. So there's a scene where Kirsten Dunst is sitting on a swing set overlooking LA Jesse Bradford comes over to talk to her and they just like talk about she's sad about this and he loves her but isn't ready to tell her and the dialogue and the performance and the way that it's shot if that was green screen this is The Room yeah (laughs) hey hey what's the matter you don't want to know ah sheer crisis I've just gotten so bogged down in all this crap Well, if it's crap, why do you do it? I don't know. So quit. Maybe I should. Yeah, I mean, if you don't like it anymore. I didn't say that. Sounds like it. Yeah, because I remember what you're talking about now, though. But yeah, and he's, that guy is really bad, too. I mean, sorry if you're listening. but Jesse Bradford. Uh, So Hollywood was really trying to make him happen. He had been a supporting actor and did a very good job in the movie Hackers. Now, that's not a great movie, but he was appropriate for that role Mm. and he had a supporting role in Romeo and Juliet. And he was pretty good in that. The Leonardo DiCaprio, Claire Danes, Romeo and Juliet, whoever thought he should be a leading man. He's he's, he didn't have it. And not that this movie did him any favors, but like he has one face that he makes over and over and over again, this goofy smile he keeps doing. And it just gets really annoying. Well, they don't give him a personality either. They just put like, well, he likes punk music. Yeah. They put band t-shirts on him and give him a guitar and like, that's good. That's his personality, you know? Yeah. He likes the Ramones. That's enough. Yeah. And the clash. One thematic thing that I thought that they did well during the movie. And I was surprised, although not so surprised. There were actually, no, there were two, there were two interesting filmmaking techniques that happened in this movie that showed that Peyton Reed was competent enough to make a better movie. One was every time they do a close-up of Dunst's face at the beginning of each routine, it was to set the tone for what was supposed to happen. So there was at least an indicator of what you're supposed to feel in a given scene. Later, there's a montage when, so the plot of this movie beyond the fact that they realize that they've ripped off this other team is that they then hire a choreographer to give them a different routine and he has peddled this routine so he's i forget the actor's name but he's one of the founders of the upright citizens brigade i don't know why he agreed to do this this way i don't, not, I don't know why they even funny. wrote this scene in the first place it's yeah. it's it's um it's borderline i it's, think it's unwatchable like i can't believe this scene even exists it's if nothing else it's really offensive extremely just, even at the time like i can see even watching that at the time like some things you can kind of be like oh well you know this was the early 2000s or whatever like i get it like even at the time i was like why like why yeah. was this even a thing like he's just in there to just insult them uh, on every level. Like, I don't even see what purpose it served in the movie. If you play different music behind what he was saying, it's a, it's like a, oh, this guy's a real monster villain kind of thing. Like, it's abusive. Yeah, it's not cute. Yeah. And none of it's hard. funny is the, is the worst offender of it all. It's just not funny. Uh, so he's peddled all these, the same routine to all these different cheer squads. And um, they're humiliated at their regional, the regionals. <laughs> I don't know, the regionals. <laughs> and for some reason, they're the ones who get in trouble for it, even though everyone has done the same routine. None of the plot really makes sense. Like even earlier, there's a a scene where she goes to find out. She goes to East Compton School because the Eliza Dushku character, who's new to school, recognizes that it's a it's a stolen routine. She takes she takes Kirsten Dunst to East Compton, and there Gabrielle Union says to her, "Hey, it's cold in here. There must be some toros in the atmosphere. You thought a white girl made that up? Is weather 
yeah. inner city thing? I mean, what, <laughs> what is the logic? Because there must be some clovers in the atmosphere. Also doesn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, it would have been very easy to just make one of the teams weather related. And then it would, this wouldn't have been an issue. The script is nonsense. So anyway, they have to learn a whole new routine because their routine at regionals was stolen. Dunst is talking about how they're going to learn from martial arts and swing dance and all this other stuff, none of which makes sense for a true routine, but does make for a kind of cool montage just for how it's edited. Um, Agree. You can see little pieces of like the Ant-Man montages where the Michael Pena, where he's planning the heists, like the way that that's edited, this is edited in that way. And you can see, oh, there's a little seed of what Peyton Reed would be. Now it's weird to talk about Peyton Reed now that quantum mania has come out and his reputation has been tarnished <laughs> but believe me it was bad before the first two ant-man movies too yes man is not a great movie either no well and how much can we blame the marvel stuff on like the directors at this point like it's clearly it's a bigger symptom of the marvel and that's a whole nother podcast so totally fair enough so i'm not gonna hold it against peyton fair enough and and you see in this scene there's a scene where eliza dushku is like punching the air right after west side story is shown in the background. It's very cool. And it's one of the only cool things in this movie. What is not cool is the brutal homophobia in this movie disguised as... So whereas we talked in Wonder Boys how it was handled like pretty delicately and night and like warmly, here's just nasty. The gay characters are are the good guys. And yet Eliza Dushku in her... In an attempt to make her sound cool and worldly, because she's not from this posh place, although her house is gigantic and her family's clearly very rich. Yeah, right. <laughs> to the point of absurdity, she says the F slur to a gay person. Oh, that's right. She does. Yeah. It's nasty. And like, to be oh. endearing, I was like, whoa, this movie is really dated. Yeah. And there's also like just a throwaway at the end where the gay guy gets to meet another guy who's maybe gay. This is nothing. You're giving us nothing. Yeah, well, and then there's the whole, speaking of aging poorly, the whole thing where the one guy, where, the, where his finger slips every time he's holding up the... He's the raping one, this girl. every And consistently, too, like, yeah. repeatedly. And she plays it off like, ha you're yeah. so mean. Yeah. Speaking of other things that didn't age well, the guy who plays Kirsten Dunst's boyfriend, his name is Richard Hillman, his role is also very strange. Like, people keep accusing him of being gay, but then he turns out to not be gay, and he's just a jerk. It's yeah. all very, like, why even bother with this character? None of it really adds, like, he does support her. But not in the right way. It's very strange. Anyway, that actor died uh, in 2008 oh, really? heroin overdose. Yeah. Oh, geez. Well, he's. Yeah. He, I don't know if he really supports her because he tells her like, "Oh, yeah, you're just you're a good cheerleader, but you you're not a good captain." You know, like he's just kind of a dick. Fair enough. He doesn't support her, but he does defend her against the meaner cheerleaders. Right. Yeah. He, so he he agrees with them basically. He's like, "Yeah, you should let them take over the team." Well, but he wants them to take over. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. This, this, it's not the plot doesn't work. It's um, all dumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I also thought Eliza Dushku's tryout scene was okay. Yeah, her acting is bad, especially like closer to the end of the movie. But her character could have been interesting if they didn't make her also obscenely rich. Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. Doesn't um, jive. Uh, what I wrote on Letterbox in my review is there's a little angry girl who punches one of the cheerleaders in, at regionals, and I just wish that she had been in more of the movie. <laughs> She's very funny. And then there's one continuity error that I thought was funny where the little brother is playing PlayStation and then it shows the PlayStation and it's open and there's no game in it. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Scandalous. you're not even trying yeah i you know and, and this is my me being juvenile but there's one scene where he's like you know oh hey i gotta tell you something to assist to his sister you gotta tell you something and he just runs up and farts on her I'm like okay i laughed at that <laughs> that character was a cartoon he was like somehow a cartoon in a movie of people that didn't make sense to begin with <laughs> it felt like he was in an anchorman style comedy and yeah. everyone else was in uh we're gonna pretend that white savior complex and appropriation is bad yeah. He had messed up hair. and uh, You can't see me on Zoom, but I'm making weird faces. I, yeah. He was in a different movie. Uh, you know what? Speaking of white savior things, I was a little bit worried, honestly, that by the end of the movie, I'm like, is the white team going to win this competition? Because at, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if that happened, you know, because they learned their new routine and they learned their lesson about how bad it was to steal from, you know, from the black team. Like, I was a little worried that might have been where they're headed. I mean, the 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 East Compton team does win the the state finals or whatever it, it national, is. And that's national like, championships. National championships, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's great. So at least they did the ending correctly. But again, they didn't, you didn't really spend that much time with the East Compton team. So it doesn't really feel like that rewarding. And again, they, they presented as more of a, is it's good for the, the Kirsten Dunst team because they learned their lesson sort right. of thing. So it's really not that rewarding. And it's just, uh, the whole thing just feels kind of hollow. 
No, but again, it's not good for the Kirsten Dunst team. It was just good for Kirsten just Dunst. Right. No one else on the team had any kind of emotional journey except for Kirsten Dunst. Right. Um, the gay guy got to meet another gay person. Good for him. And everyone else stayed exactly the same. And that, But every bit of dialogue between Kirsten Dunst and Gabrielle Union made my skin crawl. It was so unnatural. You're going to bring it. I'm going to bring it. We have an understanding. You better stay in love. And their understanding they reached was after like nothing. They'd had like two conversations with each other. And then all of a sudden at Nationals, they're just like, oh, yeah, we get each other now. It's a bad movie. It's it's a really bad movie. Yeah. And I was really hopeful for it because I remember uh, there have been a few movies that you know have happened maybe like when... Um, like say when Clueless came out, you know, Clueless came out, what, like 95, I think. So I was like 13, 14 of like, yeah. oh, this movie's about, you know, shopping and girls and stuff like, I'm not interested in that. So I never see, I didn't see it when it came out. I saw it much later and I was like, oh, this is really funny. I mean, granted, there are some problematic aspects of Clueless and those have been discussed elsewhere. You know, we don't need to go over all that, but Clueless, I still think is really funny and there's a lot of, you know, good things in it. So I was kind of hoping like, oh, hey, maybe bring it on is kind of like that kind of, you know, maybe a sleeper sort of funny interesting movie that I just missed because, you know, again, when it came out, I was like, this is not a movie I'm interested in at, at this age. It's not, it's just bad. It's bad. It's interesting because Emma Seligman uh, cited it as one of her major influences for bottoms. And it's wild how good bottoms is and how bad this movie is. And, and how much better it is at everything. Yeah. Everything it tries. Yeah. Before we watched bring it on, I had recently watched uh election uh, the alexander payne movie that also takes place primarily around a high school and it was i was just struck by how uh different and how much better the characters were written in election and how much more the high school characters seemed like actual people with actual feelings and motivations and said things that like real people would say and felt things <laughs> that real people would think and it was uh it had come out i think maybe a year before bring it on so it was you know, they didn't come out like right exactly at the same time, but it was pretty close. It was just really a stark uh, difference to see, you know, that that there are people who can write high school characters as real people. <laughs> so they're out there. Yeah. And in the 20 years since it's happened a lot. I mean, we've got Perks of Being a Wallflower and mm -hmm. Edge of 17. Sure. That's a good one, yeah. Yeah. And then like even more recently, even younger people like, I mean, eighth grade, which is just impossible for me to watch. Um, well, my daughter's in sixth grade right now. So yeah. Right. In that more than that, that age group, like, uh, are you there? Goddess me, Margaret. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of movies where, where kids aren't drawn as total caricatures. Uh, I had also watched election kind of recently because I would like for us now that, now that I've seen the holdovers, I would like for us to do our Alexander Payne bonus episode, but we're going to have to wait till you can see the holdovers to do that. Yes. I'm in a, in an area where it will be, uh, when it goes wide only. So I'm still probably waiting a couple of weeks. I saw a post for it. It was like advertising where it is now. And it's eight theaters in the country. I happen to live near one. Well, that's um, lucky you. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm actually right now wearing my Entree New Holdovers t-shirt, which is fun. Oh, very nice. Anyway. Um, okay, cool. Glad we got to do this addendum. Yes, definitely. Well, there's one other movie I was looking at so that, that had a good high school character, and it was with Kristen Wiig, The Diary of a Teenage Girl. That's another one. Uh, Belle Pauly is the teenage girl in that one. I've seen that movie. That's a real bummer. I don't yeah. <laughs> don't watch that if you're looking for a happy movie. Yeah, it's a real bummer, but it's you know, it's, I thought it was pretty good. Well, speaking of good movies, let's talk about our top 10s for 2000. All right. I have, tw I have 20. But do you have 20 or do you have just 10? I have 20, just... so I'll just run through very quickly my yeah. 11 through 20 starting with 20 because it's like as low as mission impossible 2 is my number 20 oh okay yeah right and then dude where's my car chicken run gaia girls actually i do recommend gaia girls if you're at all into professional wrestling it's a documentary about training japanese women professional wrestlers and it's one of the most oh, yeah. brutal documentaries you'll ever see princes and princesses uh cut out animation movie it's kind of cool keeping the faith i don't know if you want to see ed norton do a rom-com uh x-men the original Almost Famous, Gladiator, and Aaron Brockovich. Those are like my actual honorable mentions, those three. My 20 through 11, I've got a movie called Sunshine. Then Before Night Falls uh, by Julian Schnabel. 18 is American Psycho. Uh, 17 is Dancer in the Dark, starring singer Bjork. 16 is Nurse Betty by Neil Laboot. Uh, number 15, I have The Cell with Jennifer Lopez. 14, Shadow of the Vampire, one of the great Willem Dafoe performances. Chicken Run, I have at number 13. Ed Harris's Pollock, I have at number 12. And then uh, the Christopher Guest mockumentary Best in Show, I have at number 11. I love Best in Show, but it's not on my list because I haven't seen it in so long. We watched right. it pretty recently. It still holds up really well. My number 10 is Traffic, which we talked about briefly on this podcast. Uh, uh, number 10, I have a film called State in Maine. It's a David Mamet film. My number nine is In the Mood for Love, which we've talked about on this podcast, but because of the way that release years work, it shows up on my 2000 list. Shows up in my 2001, so yeah. Very high on my list. Uh, but number nine for me in 2000 is a movie called Quills, with starring Jeffrey Rush as the Marquis de Sade. I was just talking about that movie with someone recently. 
Oh, it's great. Uh, my number eight is Wonder Boys. Ah, good choice. Number eight for me is Rod Lurie's The Contender, starring Joan Allen, Jeff Bridges, and Gary Oldman. Uh, very uh, still relevant today. Very good. I don't know that movie. You well, you would love it. I'll check it out. My number seven is a movie I think you might not like by a director you do like. Uh, it's Oh Brother or Art Thou? Uh, no, I like um, I like Oh Brother or Art Thou. It's just not one of my favorite. It's lower on my list of Coen Brothers movies, but I do really like it. Yep, cool. Uh, seven for me is Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. That is my number four. Ah, yeah, I mean, it's a great one. My number six is The Emperor's New Groove, the Disney animated film. I think it is, I think I probably have in like my top, top 10, top 15 Disney movies. I really like that movie. Yep, that's a good one. Six for me is Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream. I I was thinking about rewatching because I watched a bunch of Aronofsky movies I hadn't seen before and I decided not to. Yeah. I, I saw it in college and I feel like I'm good. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a hard one. Uh, number five for me is Castaway, uh, Tom Hanks movie. Oh. Really, really fun. I haven't seen that one in a long time. It's uh, Megan and I have been talking about it, though, to for a rewatch. So it might be on our list. Um, five for me is Kenneth Lonergan's You Can Count on Me with uh, Laura Linney. And I th- not the first movie, but probably one of the first starring roles for Mark Ruffalo. Very good. Uh, I'm a uh, my number four is um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, as I said. Cool. <clears throat> yep. Very good. Uh, number four for me is uh, Stephen Freer's High Fidelity. That's my number one. Ah, so great. I'm a dirty, dirty liar. And my number three is Best in Show. I have oh. it. <laughs> enough. Good. Three for me is Wonder Boys. Number two for me is Memento. Ah, okay. That one also, that's that's a 2001 for me because it opened in the States in the spring of 2001. Got it. That's number two for me, that is Traffic. Uh, and then I mentioned my number one is High Fidelity. And my number one is Almost Famous. Uh, great. So that's 2000. We'll be back next week with, we haven't decided yet, but you'll listen to it, I hope. Thank you for watching. Thank you for, thanks for sticking around. Thank you for being a friend. If you want to know what is coming out next week, go to our Letterbox profile. You can find me at Brad Garoon on Letterbox. I think Jake, you're Jake Ziegler on Letterbox. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, Jake underscore Ziegler. And both of us have pinned to our profiles our Never Did It podcast list. You could also just search for the Never Did It podcast list. And the two movies that will be discussed on next week's episode are always at the top of that list. So check that out. And thank you for joining us for Never Did It.